Our final speaker of the morning is Adrian Furnham, and for many of you here, he probably needs no introduction. I first encountered Adrian many, many years ago. In fact, I was quite astonished to calculate it was actually 36 years ago. He doesn't remember me at all, but I was uh, an undergraduate, psychology undergraduate at UCL, and at that time, Adrian was a lecturer in social psychology. And for those of you who've heard Adrian present, it will come as no surprise to learn that he was a hugely entertaining lecturer, um, more of a storyteller, really, or <laughs> raconteur. Um, and I'm not sure how many notes I ever took in his lectures. I just sat back and enjoyed the performance. Um, in 1992, Adrian was appointed Professor of Psychology at UCL. And this year, he became Professor of Psychology at the Norwegian Business School. He's a prolific writer of journal articles, books, newspaper columns, and he's also enjoyed a very rewarding friendship and professional dialogue with Bob Hogan over many years. And this morning, he's going to talk to us about why managers fail and derail an investigation into the dark side. So over to Adrian. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm an organizational psych, a chartered organizational psychologist, and my interest is on behavior in the workplace. And these are some of my heroes. Bob Hogan, one of the most clever, widely read, iconoclastic, and generous of men, generous with his ideas. And he influenced me a great deal. How many books do you think there are in the English language with the word leadership in the title? Any advance? Give me a number. 21,000. 21, Any advance of 21,000? 80,000. 80,000. The answer is 76,000 uh, books. Um, I've written some of them. Um, <laughs> there is good news. Uh, there is a good one somewhere coming up on leadership uh, in the title. OK. And I also go into the real world and do consulting. We old academics very badly paid, so we need consulting. And there is my top client. I hope you know who my top client is. I said I didn't need a fee. I needed a knighthood. But so far, it hasn't come through. <laughs> a few years ago, I was fortunate about giving a talk in uh, Dubai with a, a guru, a real guru. And he, uh, Marcus Buckingham, first break all the rules. And he said something that I've never forgotten. He said, there are only three types of jobs. Technical jobs, supervisory jobs, and strategic jobs. You are hired for your technical knowledge. You go to university and you learn stuff. You do engineering or you do dentistry. It's a mystery why anyone does dentistry. But you do engineering or accountancy or history even. And you then come out of university with qualifications and with knowledge and with attitude, and they hire you. They hire you for your ability, your knowledge, your skill. You look right. What, he said, do they do to you when you are successful at the job? They promote you into not doing it. So if you're a very successful engineer, and why have you become an engineer? Because you don't like or understand people. They then <laughs> promote you into running the engineering faculty. If you're good at that, then you get the really sexy job. That is the corner office, and you are promoted to strategy. And strategy is exciting. But from, to go from one to the other to the other is not straightforward. Indeed, as Scott said earlier, I've, I've done a paper on promoting salespeople into managerial roles and why it doesn't work. And our book, my book with David Pendleton on this, we use the same idea. And the issue is of people who are good at doing the stuff, then having to do the leadership stuff, which they don't like. And it's a big problem for organizations. You know, can you coach and train leadership? You know, is, it, is it possible? You can only do this through three methods. You can do it through uh, experiential learning. You set people uh, assignments that they are supposed to achieve, stretch assignments. Some organizations do this. Young managers are appointed and given assignments, and they learn during the assignments. It's not a test. It's a test of their learning. Or you could do 
three weeks at Harvard Business School at 30,000, and PowerPoint. Can you teach people to become a leader by PowerPoint? Possibly. Can you teach people to ride a bicycle by PowerPoint? Can you teach people to swim by PowerPoint? It's not entirely clear what you can teach by PowerPoint. <laughs> but also, you can teach by coaching. So there's experiential learning, teaching, and coaching. And the question is, can you take them around the circuit? And it's very problematic. This um, is an important distinction I want to make between what one might call incompetence and derailment. I was very fortunate to inherit the chair, literally the chair, of a man called Norman Dixon, who wrote a book called The Psychology of Military Incompetence. It's a very interesting book. It's a book on looking at British uh, military failures, the Battle of Kut, the Battle of the Sanj Luan, the fall of Singapore. And was that a consequence of leadership? Were they bad leaders? Is that why? Can you explain it? Can you commit the fundamental attribution error and blame it in terms of the individuals? And he was very interested in people being over-promoted. Now, I have worked for organizations, have to, be, have to remain nameless, where you get promoted by going gray, wrinkly, and wide. And that's the primarily reason why you're promoted. Got nothing to do with your abilities. And hence, there are these organizations, you see people fail because they can't do it. They're lacking something. They're lacking ability. They're lacking foresight. They're lacking um, uh, courage. I'm not going to talk about those people because Bob and all the people here in the dark side, it's not a matter of competence and incompetence. It's a matter of something else. And I argue that incompetence is lacking something derailment is having too much of something else. There's been a book come out, a very interesting report on, it's called Booted, Busted, and I can't remember what the other one is, on people who have cocked up. You might recognize, you remember Bernie Madoff, uh, Bob Diamond, uh, some people, depending on where you come from, David Petraeus was an American general. Here are a number of people who um, one could argue were derailed. Uh, in all sorts of ways, and those are the explanations for, part explanations for the derailment. It's not that uncommon. Have you seen, by the way, that David Owen has just brought out a book on Trump, on, na on the narcissistic characteristics of President Trump? David Owen, who I uh, have shared a number of uh, correspondence with, um, is very interested in this. He's very interested in narcissism. It's one of the explanations we shall come across. And of course, you see this man and his incredible... Did you see him at the, at the um, armistice day with the coat where Putin touched him, which he hated? Putin patted him, knowing that's a sign of power. And he rustled his... <laughs> anyway, it's terribly interesting. Okay, here's an old slide. Um, this is a slide from, 19, uh, from the year 2000. This is the early work. I've traced this back, the early work on derailment. Nearly all American work, good work. And the question is, if you say to people, you know, you go in front of a group of bankers or people, and you say, well, what percentage of people cock up? What percentage of people uh, who are uh, promoted to senior positions? What and they'd say, oh, 5%, 8%, something or the other. Well, there's the data. Now, yes, you're going to say to me, what exactly is failure and derailment? And I, we can spend some time doing this. But the moral of the story is it's very high, and it's hidden and covered up, because it's embarrassing. It's a very high percentage, and there are some very old figures, not billions. Uh, there's a sign missing there. This is the costs we've already talked about. Scott talked about the costs of getting it wrong. It's very, very expensive and highly problematic. Now, it goes wrong for a number of reasons, and my, I have two of my most brilliant PhD students here, one of whom is just been PhDs and one is about to. This is my colleague, Luke Tregown, and we have worked on, on disenchantment, on what happens when, a man when you are uh, reporting to a manager and he or she pisses you off, disenchants you. And we have a model of this where we look at such is interest issues as, as bullying and perceived inequity and broken promises and distrust and so forth, and how the actions of the derailing leader cause disenchantment in the staff, which cause subsequently lower job satisfaction and lower productivity. We can talk about that if you're interested. I want to dwell on a number of slides. This is so far the most important one. The HDS 
is modeled to some extent on the DSM-4. Am I speaking complete jargon? Are you, are you with me? The HDS was the, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for 2000, not the revised one. The American um, uh, Statistical Manual for, for Personality Disorders. Bob had the tremendous insight, no one's being able to copy it, by seeing that this system works very well with understanding the dark side. Well, the problem with psychiatry, to some extent psychology likewise, is the unreliability of diagnosis. So, you know, you, you see these court cases, psychiatrist number one comes up and says this, and psychiatrist two comes up and says something different. When I go back to Norway frequently, I always say to these people, Breivik, do you remember Breivik? The one who killed all those young people. What's wrong with Breivik? What's his diagnosis? And someone say he was a paranoid schizophrenic. He couldn't be schizophrenic. He was paranoid, paranoid personality, but, not, but he was comorbid, so he was narcissistic. You get into all this palaver. And the psychiatrists had a huge fight. You can trace it. I'm actually tracing it for a big talk. On the Because in DSM-1, in DSM-1, homosexuality was a personality disorder. In DSM-4, per, uh, um, passive-aggressive stop being a personality disorder. And so forth. So you see this interesting tracing over time where, you know, the, the, in the old days, it used to be fun. Uh, if you, if someone who was diagnosed in America as schizophrenic would come on holiday to England and he'd just be thought of as slightly eccentric. <laughs> My disorder, I've been cured because it's been abolished from DSM 4 to DSM 5. <laughs> but the point of the story is some people said this list of 11 or 12. Really, the unreliability of diagnosis is not good enough. What we need to understand is the fundamental factors underlying all of the dark side. So what are the processes that cause the problem? And this is, I think, a brilliant... The idea is from a, a brilliant paper published in 2013, the same time as DSM-5. And they said this. There are three factors underlying the personality disorders, three factors underlying the dark side, three profound warning factors for those of you who are interested in choosing or coaching managers. Number one, does this person do relationships? Are they able to establish and maintain happy, healthy relationships? We heard what the Hogan definition of, of leadership is. It's the ability to form and maintain a team more successful than your competitors. So it's a team sport. It's a relationship issue. Can you do relationships? Are you a, do you know what it means to be in a relationship? I don't mean a, a romantic relationship. Do you know what it means to be a friend, to be an associate? Do you understand the process? We can go back to the past. Do you have school friends and university friends and friends from where you previously worked? And what is the nature of your friendship network? Do you understand the meaning of friendship? Do people like and trust you? But if you go to the list, none of them could do it. Schizoid can't, narcissist can't, uh, 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 antisocial personality. All of these people can't do relationships. So when you're phoning up about a person in the past, ask about their relationship. That's why you are so interested in 360, because 360 gives you the information from others. Can this person... Yes, yes, people get divorced. Yes, yes, we don't keep our friends for all time. But do you understand the process of friendship formation. And if you don't, party's over, ding, 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 thank you very much. It's fundamental to the business of management. It's the business of establishing, maintaining happy, healthy, productive relationships. And you can go through bad times together. I don't know about you, but for the first time in my life, I've lost friends over Brexit. I'm wearing my Brexit cufflinks here tonight. <laughs> But it's, a, it's interesting, isn't it, that you can, you can have arguments with friends, passionate arguments with friends, and yet stay friends. One of the markers. So that's a very important marker. Secondly, and I'll talk about this in a moment, it's about do you know yourself? How self-aware are you? Do you know your strengths and... Strengths and... <laughs> You're going to get a book prize. There are two book prizes. We gave out weaknesses. Are you, do you know who you are? Do you know where your strengths lie? Albeit that you might not have a lot of them. Do you know what you're not good at? Do you know how you come across? It's very interesting. I was with my friend Raj Perso at breakfast the other day, and we were talking about high-yield questions, questions which get a lot, a lot from the client. And my favorite is, if 
I know you well, and if I'm being honest, what is my greatest compliment I could give you? I think that yields a high, a high yield question. And he said, he gave me two, which I thought was very good. One was, what is it you think that people don't understand about you? And then he said, and when was the happiest year of your life, or the happiest time of your life? But it's the question of what people that you think, it's this business about reputation, what you think about yourself, and what other think about, others think about you. So the second is self-awareness. That's why we go through all the, give people all these damn questionnaires to try and increase their self-awareness. Haven't you come across trying to give people the HDS and they've rejected your feedback? You think, ding, maybe there's a reason for that. And finally, there's the issue of major changes and adaptation. Are you able, at any age and stage, to embrace differences, changes, things that are not consistent? There are some organizations and some people who almost rejoice in the opposite. My mother was a missionary in darkest Africa. All your speakers today are colonials. And I was well-churched. My first degree was in divinity. Um, I discovered women and drink, uh, indeed, on the same night, and therefore decided not to become a priest. But I was well-priested, pre- well uh, or well-churched, I think is the word. And the story I want to tell you is, is going... I had to give a seminar in Ireland to bishops, which was quite intimidating, 24 chaps in pink frocks in front of you. And I didn't know quite how to begin... So I thought I'd begin with a prayer which would impress them. So I took my, my choice prayer was from the Office of Compline, which is the last prayer of the last service of the day in the Benedictine order. And it goes like this. Protect us, O Lord, through the silent hours of this night, that we who are fatigued by the chances and changes of this fleeting world may repose among thy eternal changelessness. What does it mean? Don't change anything. And maybe church attendance figures are partly a consequence of it. (laughs) Can you do relationships? Do you know your strengths and weaknesses? Are you adaptable? Amen. Thanks for the lecture. (laughs) Okay, so why is it? Why is it that we spend a lot of time and effort, and organizations spend a great deal of time and effort, selecting people for senior roles who then derail? How does that occur? Well, it occurs for three reasons. The first is this, a two-by-two, how to become a consultant. You must be able to do that. (laughs) Well, what are you doing? The selection is easy. For God's sake, look, you select the good people and reject the bad people. What's your problem? (laughs) The issue, of course, is when you make a mistake. Oh, what have I done? When you make a mistake, and it's a bad decision. We've all made bad decisions. We've all selected bad people. Amen? Look at the divorce statistics if you want to question this. And we never know about people we reject. The problem is, in the business of selection, we're always told by nice HR people, what you've got to do is you've got to find our special list of competencies. They're completely unique to us. No one's got them until you do consult. They've all got the same. And what you've got to look for, you've got to look for behavioral evidence. You've got to look for evidence, lots of evidence, that they have these behaviors. Now, there are two problems with that. One of the problems is that there's always selecting in, not selecting out. You're looking for what you want, not for looking for what you don't want. Now, I teach the military. The military are the cleverest people I've ever taught. I know that. I give them intelligence tests. They're as bright as my PhD students. Not as bright as the two here today, but bright as most of them. They're very smart people, the military. Very smart, the, the, the senior officers. And I was giving a talk, and there sitting at the corner was a nuclear submarine captain. Now, that's a serious job, boys and girls. I just shuffle pieces of paper around. But this person is responsible for important stuff. If he makes a mistake, pfft, Moscow could go. Or Brussels, if you're depending on your preference. <laughs> I'm going to be punished. I'm going to be punished, I know. <laughs> but who selects out? When you're selecting a nuclear submarine captain, my God, do you look carefully at them. Because they can cause numerous. This is not just the share price falling. It's, it's disaster. It's a, nuclear, it's a nuclear war. There are other organizations. The police, when they, give, when they look at people with firearms, they look to select out. What are you in the business of selecting out for? Ah! 
dark side measure. How do they behave under stress? Why is it that nobody does this? And why do they say, oh, we didn't know he was a narcissistic psychopath? <laughs> you didn't look, did you? And that's where the problem lies. Next, the idea of the people say, look for evidence of this characteristic and make sure you get lots of evidence that this person is very high on this. Well, what's wrong with that? The answer is that most human characteristics, all human characteristics, there are very, very few human characteristics which are not normally distributed. Not everybody is creative. If, everybody, if you go to a seminar and say, we're all creative, walk out. They're lying to you. It's not true. All human characteristics are normally distributed. There are very few which are not. Handedness is one. Gender, sex, or whatever it's called now is another. But by and large, these are normally distributed, which means there are some people who are very, very high and very, very low. And this is an example of narcissism. So you want your leader to be self-confident. You want them indeed to be highly self-confident because that's how they sell themselves. You want your leaders to say, I can deal with the economy. I can sort out the NHS. I can do this. You think, oh, maybe you can. Maybe you can. But where do you cross the line from that to subclinical narcissism. You could see it in Tony Blair. He was, he was okay at, uh, at Princess Diana's funeral. He started crossing the line. And then he crossed the line completely into full-flooded narcissism, I think. The question is, optimal, not maximal. And this is the work of, of Kaiser, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Enough of this quality. You need to be bright enough. There's no correlation, there's no data which suggests there's a linear correlation between intelligence and almost anything. It's curvy linear. And the question is therefore optimality, needing enough. And my students never forget a little um, uh, presentation I do that, uh, that they can remember. The only thing they remember 20 years later about my lectures is this. I say to them, you know, how clever are you? You, if I gave you an intelligence test, a, a relax, a, an accurate, reliable, sensitive test, how clever are you? Write down your score. There you are. Most people are 100. If you score 150 and you're one standard deviation, if you score 130, you're two standard deviation. You can join Mensa. How clever are you? I'll give you a reliable actual, actual test. How clever are you? And then I give them a test. So I've got their actual score and the estimated score. And you can see how clever they are. And you can see their estimates. You know? There are, of course, these very unusual people up here who are very clever, but don't think they are. And they're called? Right. Women. <laughs> <laughs> whether you believe you can and whether you believe you can't, you're right. And women are socialized. Go, go to my TED talk on this, he said, showing off on this issue. If you don't think you're bright, your behavior isn't not very bright. Unfortunately, if you don't no, you're not very bright, but you think you are. There are some interesting and important consequences. And so the issues are, and nobody thinks like this, that derailing behaviours can occur on either side of the extreme, too much of or not enough of these, these characteristics. And these are the, this is the work of, um, of uh, uh, Robert Kaiser, which is so important. OK, so where have we got to? Surprisingly high number of people cock up at work, fail and derail. Why? Well, because they're not, they don't look for the three simple characteristics. Can you do relationships? Are you self-aware? Are you adaptable? Two, they've been badly selected in the sense that nobody's looked for the dark side stuff. Or indeed, they've assumed linearity. This is one of my favorites. This is the work taken from um, uh, Morgan McCall, his book called High Flyers. It's a good book. He's, uh, he's from... Um, uh, uh, what's it called? The South Carolina Center for Creative, Creative Leadership. It's well written. And he's talked about these typical um, competencies. And this is what it's like to have too much of that competency. So are you a good team player? I remember years ago, I must look at the time, uh, a man saying to me, I'm a good team player. And I thought, yeah, I don't, I just don't believe that. Was it? Well, he was. But the question, why was he? He wasn't very he needed his team to give him information, and hence they manipulated him. So although he was good with people, because he needed the people, the consequence was it had drawbacks. Customer-focused, biased towards action. You know, Nike, just do it. Do you want that? Just do it? 
That's called functional impulsivity or dysfunctional impulsivity. <laughs> my wife says she's going to put on my grave. His problem was instant gratification didn't come quickly enough. <laughs> she <laughs> accuses me of dysfunctional impulsivity. I think I'm a functional impulsive, but there you are. Analytical thinker, integrity, surely not. Surely, of all the characters, you can't have too much integrity. Uh-huh. Can you be zealous? Can you be a, a, a person who is, is holier than thou, rigid, inflexible? I wish the lines between the good and the bad, the grey and the, and the whatever were clear. They're not. And it can be that this rigidity is a sort of OCD of the moral world, which gives you an interesting problem. Good with people, good with people. That's the interesting one. Surely, surely you can't be too good with people. Well, one of the characteristics you notice in successful bosses is their ability to give people negative feedback and to deal with issues and, where necessary, to sack people. And those people who are too cuddly and warm and agreeable and high EQ are not rated very highly by their colleagues, because they are, by their staff, because they see their inability to deal with problem people. So you need the courage and the ability to deal with those. So it can be that very high scores on those characteristics, all and each, are problematic. What also happens is you find these people who are anointed as high flyers. This is, again, McCaw, who are chosen and put into the something or the other group. Their faults are and, for, for, and, and limitations are forgiven. Belbin talks about acceptable limitations, I think they're called, allowable weaknesses. Allowable weaknesses. People say, oh, well, I know he's a bit schizo, he's very cold, he's OCD, but we'll get him a coach. Uh-huh. They are fast-tracked because they're spectacular, and then they collapse and go down badly. Final slide from McCall. He says, basically, you can take big businesses, and you find that they do fall into neat little silos. Whether you like it or not, there's the marketing people and the operations people and the growth people, and they're good at some things and not good at others. Amen. The question is how, how much they're aware of their weaknesses and how they compensate for them. Okay, Bob says that essentially derailing occurs on four levels. First of all, the self-awareness, poor self-management, nearly always, in my view, poor emotional self-regulation, terribly important. Next, there is can they do relationships? Are they, can they manage themselves? Can they manage others? Next, this business about delegation, including empowerment, do they understand the basics of leadership, and finally, do they understand the business? Are they wise about the business? Can they do the difference between tactical and uh, um, uh, strategic? And do they understand how the business works? Why are all CEOs from finance? Name me one British big British organization where the CEO comes from HR. <laughs> Why? That's the reason. HR people don't read the FT, start the jargon. How does the damn business work? And if you don't know how it works, you won't ever get to the position of being in charge of the business. Now, this is an important slide. It's taken from my hero, Tim Judge. He's got a brilliant website. He's the best living organizational psychologist in the world, in my view, Tim Judge. And he's written this paper in Leadership Quarterly on the toxic triangle. And he makes exactly the point that Anne made about the fundamental attribution error. He said, you don't get fire without heat, oxygen, and fuel. If you're a firefighter, what you know is you take away one of those. If you starve the fire of oxygen, it goes out. If you starve the fire, the fire of fuel, it goes out. But the three components make for the bad stuff. Now, we psychologists focus in on the bad guy, on the, on the dark side, on the destructive, tyrannical leader. And we list all the characteristics, and we're right. We are right. They play an important role. But, he said, there are two others. One is the conducive environment. Why are the financial sector people squealing about regulation? Because in a deregulated environment, you can do bad stuff. It's easy to do bad stuff in a deregulated environment. I remember this psychopathic 
man I was in, interviewing. I knew he was very high psychopathic. He was on his HDS. And I said to him, you know, where, he was very high. I said, where did you like working? Oh, he was head of HR. Where do you like working? Well, Russia. He said, I love Russia. Oh, I said, why? He said, oh, it's like the Wild West. You can get things done there. <laughs> and then someone's got to go along with you. It's all very well you being a nasty, destructive individual, but you've got to persuade and bring people along with you. You need susceptible people, and some people are more susceptible than others as a function of the context or a function of the environment. This is the bright side and the dark side. We've talked about that. Um, uh, uh, Scott's talked about that. And it's the dark side stuff that is uh, uh, particularly interesting. Now, here we have a comparison of um, the dsm 4 and the very, very brilliant way in which Hogan has taken the concepts and uh, adapted them to the world of work. I think it's astonishingly clever work, and Hogan has no competitors, which makes the HDS, I think, sparkling and very, very impressive. It's interesting, two people called Dotlich and Cairo stole all Bob's ideas, and they wrote a book called Why CEOs Fail. It's a very readable little book, and what this is is the same language as that. And what they've done is they've simply translated it into what you and I might call happy psychobabble. So arrogance is, of course, narcissism. When I say to my soldiers, I say to these, these are colonels and generals, and I say, what characteristic do you most want to look for to select people out? They all shout out arrogance. Very, very sensitive to arrogance. And, you know, we spend a lot of time building up self-esteem in people, and so they become clinically not grandiose but vulnerable narcissists. And so what they've done here so usefully, so there's perfectionism. Perfectionism is OCD. Melodrama is histrionic personality disorder. Volatility is borderline, which in Hogan terminology is excitable, Princess Diana's uh, particular problems. Now, these, of course, can be classified at a higher level. But let's not worry about that at the moment. Okay, so here we have, um, here is the DSM. There is Hogan. This is a brilliant book, Hogan, uh, Alderman Morris, and the book is called The Personality Self-Portrait. I have five copies, which I've lent and never got back. It's brilliant. Alderman is the world's expert on personality disorders. Morris is a journalist, and they've done this brilliant book. There's Miller, clinical psychologist. Many people have realized, and you might recognize this work of somebody uh, in this country. What they've all done is they've said this is a really, really helpful system to classify and understand darkness. However you want to classify it, it's darkness. There are characteristics here which, if you manifest them in a leadership situation, cause, to, cause mayhem. Now, the psychiatrists have classified, have put the 11 or 12 or 13, depending on whether you're DSM 1, 2, 3, 4, they've got a higher order structure, which they call the odd and eccentric, paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal, dramatic, emotional, and erratic, antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic, and anxious and fearful. What Bob did, he read Karen Horney. If you want to read a feminist, girls, Read Karen Horney. She is astonishing. She is a German psychoanalyst who went to America in the 1940s and 50s. Brilliant work. A very early, powerful feminist and one of tremendous insight. Recommend Karen Horney. And she classified people, and the Hogan people have used this terminology, not this one from the psychiatry, but this one from Karen Horney, saying people move away from others, they move against others, or they move towards others. Now, my friend and hero, Hans Eising, said this exactly. He said, this is, of course, um, the uh, Eisenkian three, moving away from others is neurotic, moving against others is psychotic, and moving towards others is extrovert. But here we have an easier way to think about it, a higher order classification. And it is always the um, moving against others. It's the need for power. Not the need for love and the need for independence, but the need for power, which is the dangerous one, which is the one that gets you in the end. So Freud talked about anxiety, hysteria, and obsessionality, horny, etc. So we have 
the three ways in which, again, I attribute this slide to um, uh, Robert Kaiser, that group one influence charm managed by intimidation, others by seduction, and the third by, by compliance. So these are ways of thinking of this at a much higher order. For me, if you go down these disorders, the ones which are most closely associated with leadership failure and derailment are the following. And I'm, I'm going to knock out schizoid. The first is antisocial. This is psychopath. Now, if you ask people what are the abiding characteristics of a psychopath, they know, almost no one gets this. They all say lacking in empathy. They're all lacking in empathy. But the abiding characteristics of the psychopath is they are not remorseful. No guilt. That's the abiding characteristic. That's what makes him so powerful. If you are good-looking, intelligent, charming, narcissistic, and a psychopath, my God, you can make money. <laughs> because you can do things to people and hurt them profoundly through their pocket, their heart, and all sorts of other ways with no guilt. Then there's narcissists. I'm not going to say much more about them. It's very interesting, the two different types, the vulnerable and the, and the grandiose. A brilliant paper in HBR by Ketz de Vries on the inability. Have you ever tried coaching a narcissist? Well, they don't volunteer for coaching. And if they do, they coach you. It's a very interesting issue on how to deal with narcissism. And narcissism, of course, is rife. There's all sorts of issues around narcissism. Then there's paranoia, an interesting one in certain jobs, of course. It's a good thing to be paranoid. You need a bit of sensitivity. I have been looking here at the cameras. To, I think there are four. I can't see the way the microphones are, but there might be a time that a bit of paranoia does you some good. Um, then there are schizoid, schizoid people. These are the um, uh, cautious. They never make it to... This is my disorder, so we have to go over this quite quickly. Um, and then there's OCD, of course. And the, the issue about OCD is is where is the line? You know, in some jobs, the job I am currently uh, working at the moment, most of the people from an outsider's point of view look OCD to me. But the job requires what their favorite word is granularity. It means getting it right, getting the figures right. And there's some jobs, you know, internal audit, quality control. A bit of OCD does you a lot of good. You've got to get it right first time. You've got to see the order and you've got to see the pattern. But where, you, where do you cross the line between that and OCD full-blown, where people cannot let go. They have to go through things again and again. The first time in this organization, you have to submit your slides to a committee of five. You can see mine haven't gone through this particular process. And they'll go the process and they'll say whether that should be a semicolon or whatever. You think, why? OK. So there's OCD. What I want to do is just show you some data at the end. I have been very pleased and charmed and honored to be working with uh, Jeff and, and uh, Gillian because they provided me some of their uh, data. And we academics are very data hungry. And my appeal to you is I've got two of my students. If you are sitting on some HDS or HPI or any other sort of data, particularly where you have a criteria variable, uh, Luke and I were talking about, we've got a, we're working for an organization where we've got sales figures. So we've got personality and we've got sales figures. So you can see what predicts what. And this is not my study. This is um, El Salgado, I think the top Spanish psych psych psychologist. And this is a list of the dark side factors. And he's got task performance, context performance, and overall performance. And what I want you to see, it's not very sophisticated. The end's not very big. But all the correlations are negative. The more you have of that, the less you have leadership ability. Uh, this is a study on uh, years to management and years to senior management. So what we have is we have, this was provided by Kaizen, uh, the consulting firm, which is a beautiful data set. So we have the, their uh, bright side and their dark side. That is the Neo, and there's uh, the um, uh, uh, Hogan dark side, the HDS. And our question is, what of these, how much does bright side and dark side predict speed to promotion to management, and then speed to senior management. And so the correlations should be negative. Negative means it's faster. You go up the greasy pole faster if the correlations are negative. And so what you see is 
there, cautious, has the opposite effect. You're very low. You don't get promoted with being too cautious, almost by definition. You, don't, you see, this is all. All these are moving away. These are moving here, are moving against. And look at this one. Colourful. Schizoid. Not schizoid, schizotypal. Colourful people, fortunately I'm colourful, is gets you up the greasy pole earlier because you emote. You express emotions. You're imaginative. You're a bit quirky. This helps. And look there. Bold. What's bold? Narcissist. Look at this one. What's mischievous? Psychopathic. So they both help you to get to manager and help you to get to senior manager. But there is a God. You get God in the end. It helps, you know, these dark sides get you up the greasy pole, but you come down just this fast. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is a regression. We didn't go into this. The point is I now combine them into moving against, moving away, moving towards, and you see it's the moving against. Remember, negative is sign of faster. Makes you, gets you promoted more quickly. Ah, this is a good one. Uh, we have to go through this very quickly, and then I'll end. What do you notice from the HPI? It's a fantastic instrument for lots of reasons, but it has in it these, what are called the occupational scales. So the items have been validated against a particular set of criteria. So from the HDS, uh, HPI, you can develop these scales. So you can see management potential, and you can see sales potential. And I recently published a paper which shows that promoting people from sales to management, what Scott said, is very bad news because the criteria that succeed in one are different from the other. But just look at this one. This is the one I want you to look at. So this is, so here we have sex and age, and here we have the dark side. And the question is, to what extent these different characteristics are associated with management potential? And so what you see, nearly all of them are significant that these moving against ones, particularly being excitable, borderline, up and down, emotionally unregulated, all that stuff, make very bad managers. And they never are, they, they seem to be quirky and difficult, and they never get promoted. But here we have, aha, there's our friend, narcissism, boldness. I can lead this organization forward. I can sort these problems out. You think, okay, give you the job, promote you to management. And here we have equally worrying, colourful. Mischievous doesn't work, thank God, but colourful does. So what you're doing is you, people are rated in, in, if they are uh, schizotypal and narcissistic, they're rated highly as potential managers, which is, which is, which is problematic. And um, this is the last one out of interest. I, I'm very interested in private sector and public sector. I was saying the other day, you know, there are three sectors. There's the public sector, there's the private sector, but there's the voluntary sector. And if you want to test a person's leadership, you get them to lead in the voluntary sector where nobody's being paid. You have no dosh. You have no carrot and stick. If you want to go to a charity shop and see how they run, then you test a person's leadership. But it struck me that people select for public sector and private sector rather differently. And they don't like each other. They look down on each other in a variety of ways. But this was a study because uh, um, Gillian and Jeff had big samples, so we could combine people in the private sector and the public sector and trying to see some of the huge and significant differences. And as you predict, let's see the highest one is skeptical, paranoia, much more paranoid in the private sector than in the public sector. Um, here's a, let's find another big one here. Which one's this? Mischievous. Aha. Psychopaths. Psychopaths in the private sector, much more than in the public sector. Here we have uh, diligent, which, no, uh, dutiful, which is um, 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 uh, dependent personality disorder, and you have it much more in the, in the public sector. Okay. I think that's enough. Um, Oh, this is an interesting one. I've done one on people who worked abroad. This paper's still in press on those who have worked abroad and those who haven't. And the assumption is that some of these characteristics are associated with people choosing to go abroad, choosing to leave their country. All three speakers up on the platform today have left their country of origin, although Scott's unwisely going back to his. <laughs> Let me do a quick summary. Oh, oh, oh something's happened. Let me switch some lights on. It's probably me who's cocked up. Leadership failure and derailment is common. It's not written about. You don't sell books with, with titles like this, uh, Backstabbers and Bullies. I wanted to call it Backstabbers, Bastards and Bullies, but the, 
publisher, publisher wouldn't allow it. And so it's, it's a sort of secret. It's a, there are all these books and you just throw a bit of fish around and you do the seven things and you follow the cheese or something and you become a great leader. It's not true. It's not true. You know it's not true. I know it's not true. You have, you have worked for, possibly even currently working for, a absenteeism leader, a tyrannical leader, and so on and so forth. The question is how they get there. How do they get there in the first place? What mistakes have we to learn from that? The business of selecting out, the business of maximi, maximal versus optimal. We need also to look at some of the characteristics which we can spot. You can see people's inability to, to do relationships. You can see people's inability to adapt to change. You can see some of these strong characteristics which indicate, give you an indication of the danger signs of appointing a leader who are much more like, who are likely in due course to derail. I think the instruments, the Hogan is, I'm not selling the Hogan. I'm a huge fan of Bob and a huge fan of the instrument. But I'm a, an, a, a, a practitioner. I mean, not a practitioner, I'm an academic. I'm interested in the numbers. And the numbers are good. They're good numbers. They predict. They are robust, very robust. I know that. I've played around with it a long time. And it's very satisfying, you know, as, a, as an academic to show that, as the theory says, that these characteristics that in these individuals actually have consequences, have good consequences and bad consequences, and that therefore you have predictive validity. And therefore I come to you with an evidence-based message, and the evidence-based message is you can measure and predict through a mixture of the bright side and the dark side variables, and therefore understand and prevent leadership derailment. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>